The Battle Cats is a game where you beat up other animals with a bunch of crazy cats, all while trying to take over the world. There's a ton of complex mechanics and gameplay types, but there is one major thing that the game lacks. Multiplayer. There is no direct way to interact with a specific friend in Battle Cats, whether it be versus or co-op. Technically, Dojo and Labyrinth give rewards based on how well you do compared to all other competitors, but I wouldn't count this as true multiplayer considering how bare bones it is. Now, the 3DS and Nintendo Switch versions of Battle Cats do actually have a real multiplayer feature, with both co-op and versus modes, but the game itself is quite behind the mobile version when it comes to content, so for the most part, Battle Cats is just a single player game. But just because a game is single player, doesn't mean we can't find some way to play it with others. On September 15th, 2023, the r slash Battle Cats Discord server announced the hosting of a Battle Cats Challenge Tournament. While there had been competitions before in the past, there had never been a formal tournament until now. It would be one where you could group up in teams of 2-3 to three to compete against other teams in a bracket format to see who could complete them better. The best teams would progress through the tournament until they inevitably reached the top and won. The prize pool for winning was Discord Nitro for the top two teams, and just server roles for the top four teams, which were bragging rights. This isn't a very impressive prize pool, but most people were just playing for fun, so it was fine. Now you might wonder, how would competing against another team work? What is a Battle Cats challenge? Well, to put it simply, a Battle Cats challenge is just a challenge. You've probably seen some players attempt them before, such as using little slots, low amounts of cash spent, or just the fastest time to clear a stage. Pretty much any metric in the game that is measurable and optimizable can form the core idea of a challenge. In the case of this tournament, known as the 22222 tournament, players would try to optimize a challenge more than their opponents. An example could be, say, beating Thor 30 with the least amount of slots used. The team who used the least amount of slots would be the victor, and if they tied, the winner would be chosen by a secondary clear condition that was also viewable, which was usually the fastest clear. This format of challenges would continue through the tournament from start to finish. To make it fair, every team received the same challenge each round, but every round had a different challenge than the last. I think I've explained enough about the specifics for now, so let's get into it. I joined a Battle Cats tournament. This is what happened. At the start of the announcement, players were given time to team up with each other. Originally, I wasn't going to participate because I wasn't feeling like it, and I actually considered contacting the hosts to help them sort it out, but after seeing the Nitro Prize, and just realizing the fact that this would make for a fun video, I decided to join. Some teams wanted to just play it with their friends and have fun, while other teams wanted to pair up with good players and try to win. I decided I could have both, and got my friends Sugidi and Gardangle to join my team. Sugidi is an excellent Battle Cats player, who's very good at completing challenges and is a specialist on playing Floor 30. You might also know him as the host of the E150 and E300 player events. Some of the more impressive things he's done include beating Floor 30 No Gacha No Creep with one row, keeping Hermit alive in Floor 30 No Gacha for over two hours, and creating and beating a ton of insanely hard custom BCU stages, which he likes to call Suya Tower. Given his game knowledge and a very good mechanical skill, he would prove to be a useful member to the team. Gardangle is an expert Battle Cats player who focuses on playing larger challenge runs, such as no power creep and one lineup challenges. Some of his highlights include developing lineups that beat most of the entire game, beating no return flights 3 star no creep, and beating leaky tunnel 3 star no creep. He has incredible game knowledge, so he would end up being great at helping us develop strategies. And well, to finish off the roster, there's me. I'm mostly well known for making Battle Cats commentary videos. But before that I used to grind PC challenges in RBC, 
probably more than anyone else up to a certain point. As for my highlights, uh, they would probably be like beating some of Mika's stupid challenges or something, I don't know. For our team name, we decided to give it the great title of The Hardest Leak, a reference to Gardangle's hatred for Leaky Tunnel 3 Star. Overall, our team composition was filled with incredibly good players, and we thought we had a good chance at winning. How did we do? Well, you're about to find out. Before the actual tournament started, my team was chosen to partake in a practice round to demonstrate to the others what a match would look like. So here's the round zero practice match, the hardest leak, or team 12, versus the coal miners, team 16. The coal miners consisted of Luna, Hyon, and Extreme Ducks all of which being helpers in the server, and their name being based off the joke that helpers had to slave away in coal mines. We weren't particularly scared of this team, mainly because it was a practice round, but we figured it was good to test our skills, so we tried our best. The challenge at hand was to beat Water Conservancy without any surge immune units and with the fastest clear being the winner. As for all rounds, we were given time to brainstorm ideas before engaging in a unit draft. Oh yeah, this tournament did have a draft system, where each team could pick three and ban three units each, in order to make strategies more diverse. In order to draft, the teams would first coin flip to see which one is A or B. Then they would proceed with the following order. A would ban one unit, followed by B banning two, and then A banning another one. After that, A would pick a unit followed by B picking two, and then A picking one again. After that, A would ban their final unit, followed by B doing the same, and then B would pick their last unit, with A's final pick coming right after. For this round, while I don't remember the draft order, the bans were Healer, Balrog, Hitman, Akuma, Manic Legs, and Black Zeus. Our team picks Darktanian, Driller, and Vendor, while the coal miners picked Deadeye, Crystal, and Bahamut. While they had strong units for being the stage overall, ours were simply better at clearing the stage as fast as possible. So when the round ended, our team came up on top. Here is our team's clear of this challenge. Water Conservancy, no surge immune units, in 2116 frames, or about 70 and a half seconds. While this victory didn't count towards any progress in the tournament, it did help us get into the spirit of clearing these types of challenges. We knew how to play the tournament match as well, and this would prove to be a useful skill. Shout out to all the members of the coal miners for being very nice competitors to face off against. On the 19th of September, the bracket was officially revealed. Here's what it looked like. Because of the odd number of teams, some of the teams had to start in round 2. This might seem unfair, but it had to be done in order for the tournament to continue. Which teams were chosen to start in round 2, you might ask? Well, Re, the main host, simply chose most of the teams with RBC helpers, as well as just her friends. Nepotism at its finest. Looking at our position in the bracket, there were a few teams that looked scary in our way, but it could have been worse. The two main teams we were scared to face, being Judgment, Team 4, and Carried by a Bagel, Team 19, were on the top side of the bracket, while we were on the bottom. But really, no one could tell which teams would be strong competitors, as this was the first ever challenge tournament. As a result of starting off in Round 2, we didn't really have to do anything during Round 1, except to watch. The challenge this time was to beat False Resurrection, with units 13 speed and under, 
and to clear the stage while having the lowest base HP while winning. In case of a tiebreaker, the faster run would win. With a win condition like this, you could expect units like Professor Catdrobs and Driller with uniquely special weaken percents to be the meta, and that's what it turned out to be. Players prioritized picking or banning units like them, and as someone who didn't participate in this round, I don't have much story to tell. One time, however, some players asked Kobama, who is one of the best BC players in the history of the game, to try and get a good run on this challenge. Although Kobama wasn't participating in the tournament, he accepted this request, and got a pretty fast 1 HP clear by winning and losing at the same time. In Battle Cats, there is a frame-perfect interaction where if your base and the enemy base dies on the same frame, your base will be set to 1 HP, and you will win. This knowledge would come in handy much later into the tournament, so you might want to keep that in the back of your mind. The results of round 1 were as following. The highest base HP clear submitted was 4250, and the lowest HP submitted was 1, the 1 HP run being done by the team carried by a bagel. After this round ended, here's what the bracket looked like. There were some bracket complications, and as a result, losing teams were made to play a knockout challenge with each other in order to fill the missing spots in the bracket. The victors of this challenge were teams 2 and 10. With round 1 finished, it was finally time for our team to have to compete against others in tournament matches, and unlike last time, we could not afford to lose. Round 2's challenge was announced on the 22nd, and was the following. Clear Learn to Hate in under 3 minutes, and the team who deployed the least amount of units would win. If the amount of units deployed was equal, the faster team would win. This was the first round where teams really had to think hard about what they drafted, as the units they chose would have a big impact on how well they would perform. Our opponent this time was Artists, or Team 11. They were a pretty strong team, having Tusif, Liu, and Baronator. Tusif in particular was someone who I knew was a strong player, having completed 3 slot UL and 2 slot Stories of Legend no Uber, and is almost done doing that one again no gotcha. So it's safe to say this would be a challenging match. Due to a complication of Tusif not using BCU, the levels for this round would be a bit different allowing both Balrog and Yukimura to be played at level 60. Before the draft, our team was trying to figure out the best combinations of units to clear this stage in the least amount of deployments possible. Out of all the units we tested, a few seemed to perform better than others. Dark Tanyan was an excellent damage dealer to Mina that helped us reach the base and clear the stage faster, as expected by many. Thunderjack was also a very strong unit here that did good damage to anything, and was able to push back Sunfish Jones allowing us to destroy the base faster. Those two were the best, but we also found out that Chun-Li, Dark Kazli, Dark Garu, and even E Honda were pretty nice there. Time passed, and the draft approached, but I talked with Tusef for a bit, and we decided to do a little trolling. So Tusef is a known Enchantress fan, and for fun, he had the idea of banning Enchantress, which would essentially be a completely useless ban, since Enchantress was not going to help you clear learn to hate. So, I made an agreement with him that both of our teams had to ban a completely useless unit, allowing him to do this without sabotaging his team's own draft. When it became time to draft, it went as follows. My team was A, and his was B. We start off this draft by banning Last Boss, which is a very annoying unit to have on the table due to his RNG-related performance. Know that because we are Team A, we want to have the strongest unit for the round unbanned, so that when it comes to picking, we can pick it, giving us a big advantage. Tusif knows that D'Artagnan is the best unit here, so he bans him. Balrog gets banned next due to being another very strong unit here, and it's our turn again. We know that because Tusef banned Dark and Balrog, we are guaranteed to have Thunderjack, 
we spend our second ban removing two Sif's level 60 Yukimura from the round, and secure Thunderjack as we planned. Two Sif picks Awakened Bahamut and Green Shell, and we immediately figure out what strategy he's going for. Using Green Shell to stall enemies at the base, you can clip Bahamut into Vina with the Cat Cannon, and deal lots of damage to the enemy base. With some other rushers or LD, you can kill this base and win. We actually forgot about the strategy up until this point, but at this moment we decided that developing our own strategy was more important. So we chose Chun-Li, who works very well with Thunder Jack, and now we're feeling pretty good about our draft. The final bans came, and thanks to our gentleman's agreement from earlier, we ban Surgeon Cat and Tusif bans Enchantress. Tusif then takes Tourist Cat to assist in his cheese, and we take Manic Flying to be able to run Diabolosa's attack combo. While we were pretty damn scared for a bit after we realized the potential of Tusef's strategy, we did eventually realize there was no way he could clear the stage while deploying less or equal units to us. Overall, this draft went very well from our side, and we ended up with a very solid 4 unit clear for Learn to Hate. Here it is. With our run set in place, we couldn't do much except wait for the deadline to approach, and then see if we ended up winning. On September 24th, the results came out alongside the reveal of some pretty funny draft blunders. But lo and behold, the result of my team's match turned out to be a victory. Our clear of learned hate took 4 units, while Tusif's took 8 units. Defeating someone as good as Tusif felt very relieving and we kept up our tempo all the way until the next round. Shout out to Tusif and all members of Team 11 for being great competitors in the tournament and allowing for a very fun round. Here's what the bracket looked like after this round finished. While making it to the next round was a good thing, due to the nature of tournaments, it would only get harder the more we progressed. Only the top 8 teams remained, many of which looked like strong teams who could potentially beat us. But if we did want to reach the top, we simply had to outplay every team that went against us without any failures. On the same day the round 2 results came out, the round 3 challenge was revealed. Clear Revolver Ridge without spending more than 15,000 cash, and the fastest clear wins. In case of a frame perfect tie, the winner would be decided by the lowest amount of cash spent. This was the first official round to have a speedrun based challenge, and with beating stages fast as a core Battlecats player skill, many of the teams would be very good at it. Oh yeah, and Ree got tired of Balrog being banned in literally every single draft, so this time Rog was globally banned. Amazing. One weird thing that happened near the start of the round was the discovery that Revolver Ridge was broken on BCO Mobile and for some reason the enemies there were all on base hit. To fix this, mobile BCU players would play on a custom stage remake of it instead. After that whole ordeal was sorted out, Last Voss was added to the ban list as well, due to people getting annoyed by a well-known frame hit strategy. With these two strong ubers banned, players would have the opportunity to spend their bans on more specific units, leading to lots of interesting strategies. Our team's opponent for this round was Passed Out Drunk, or Team 17. 
with Thor Panel, Marcy, and Ants. We didn't know much about how good the players on Team 17 were, so we weren't particularly scared. Team 17 was originally a two-member team, but after round two finished, Ants from Team 2 joined them. There were a ton of ways to go about playing this stage, but the one we thought of first was stacking Can-Can and Fishman on the first Dober, and then using a door on Freeze to allow them to destroy Loki extremely fast. While this was a very fast strategy, Sugadi messed around with a rusher unit, like Yukimura, and with a little optimization from me, we found a way to finish the stage before Loki even spawns. This was incredibly fast, and we believed it at the time to be the fastest possible way to clear this stage. It was difficult to pull off, needing very good RNG to get the correct Yukimura rebounds, but we believed we could do it if we had to. We developed a couple alternative strats, one of which replaced Green Shell with Brainwash Tank, and then waited for the draft to come. Here's how the draft went. The coin was flipped, and our team was A while the opposing team was B. We started off by banning Bahamut, which was simply a filler ban because we wanted to see what the opponent would do. Marcy ends up banning Fono and Defono, which both seemed like ubers who you would have used their LD to snipe the base and finish the stage early. Our team ends up banning ED next, to make it harder for them to kill Loki, and our first pick is Fishman. Fishman is a great all-rounder unit no matter what strategy you're going for, so we decided to play it safe by picking him. Marcy responds by picking Akuma and Nala. In our mind, their strategy is to kill Dober fast using Akuma, and then use Nala to kill Loki fast while chipping the base down at the same time. Our next pick is Yukimura, solidifying our commitment to the base rush strategy. Our final ban is Doron, making it much harder for the opponents to kill Loki, and they follow up by banning Black Zeus. This was probably to make it harder for us to kill Dober, but in our strategy, we don't even need to do that. Now, for the final pick, Marcy chooses Green Shell. At this point, they probably figured out that we were rushing the base, and because Green Shell was a common tool used for that, they decided to take it for themselves. Fortunately, we knew a winning strategy with Brainwash Tank, so this didn't affect us. For our final pick, we chose Rich Cat Senior, because his money combo would be very useful for rushing. Looking back at the draft, we should have picked Bullet Train at some point, but that completely skipped over our heads. Nonetheless, we felt very confident with our picks, and thought it was impossible for our opponents to beat us, provided we could pull off the base rush strategy. After a little bit of grinding, I managed to pull it off, and we began to chill as we waited for results to come out. Here's our submission. As time passed, the deadline approached, and another strategy entered my mind. Poseidon. You see, Poseidon is a rusher that has a 30% chance to do a savage blow, doing triple damage. If you try to base rush with Poseidon, if he theoretically savage blows every hit combined with good Dober waves, you can get fast enough to beat the stage before Loki spawns as well. At first, we tested this for a bit, but then realized two things. The first was that the odds were surely too low for anyone to seriously try doing this clear, and second was that it didn't even seem possible with our opponent's required picks. But as I was scrolling down the channel one day, I saw a particular message that caught my eye. Game Changer, one of the hosts for the tournament, called Ants Run Tass. Now, Tass was banned for this event but the fact that he called it that instantly made me think they were going for Poseidon RNG strats, which got me worried. Could a task level Poseidon run have beaten ours? The deadline was already over, so I couldn't make a better run. It was at this point when I realized we had lost. After ranting about how we did it in the channel, the host of the event DM'd me the scores. Our run was 788 frames, but the opponent 
and 756 frames. We lost. I checked in with two other hosts, and they said the same thing. Ants had pulled off an insane run to win. Worst of all, I checked my screenshots in the channel, and I found one of my testing runs. It satisfied all the requirements and restrictions, and was a 742 frame run. If only I had hit record that one time, we would have won. And there I was, just waiting for the results to come out, just to see the run that had beaten us. Round 3 results, Team 12 submission, 788 frames. Team 17 submission, 756 frames. Team 17 advances. We had been defeated. There was no double elimination bracket, no knockout challenge to get us back in, and not even a single team that had an empty slot for me to join. It was over. Or unless it wasn't. So, uh, yeah. We got bamboozled, completely trolled by the host of the event. Not only did we win, but we were almost three times as fast as the other team's submission. If you were wondering why they called one of his runs tasks, it wasn't because he actually used it, but because he was pausing and unpausing rapidly in one of his submissions, which was not allowed. Safe to say, everyone lost their shit at the reveal, and I was especially dumbfounded by how we actually won. Now, while this prank might seem like something bad to be an official tournament, my team knew a good amount of the hosts personally, and I myself was a content creator getting trolled, so it was all in good fun. Shout out to Ants and the other members of Team 17 for being great competitors, and making a very fun prank. But now, we were in semi-finals, and this is what the bracket looked like. Just four teams left, and all of them seemed threatening. Bagel's team, or Team 19, was a team we were scared of from the start, but sat on the opposite side of the bracket, against F2P Force to play, or Team 18. F2P was another team we expected to be the one to win the whole tournament, so we had no clue which was actually gonna win. Meanwhile, we were going up against Gilgamesh X Queen V, or Team 14. We actually expected to fight Team 21 at this point, but Team 14 managed to beat them to our surprise. We didn't actually expect them to be too difficult, but we would quickly take that back when Round 4 started. On the very same day right after the results for Round 3 were shown, the next round's challenge was also shown. Or well, this round was a bit different, having three challenges to complete. The first one was Don't Rush Love with the most amount of cash spent in under 3 minutes. This challenge had a very simple approach and strategy behind it, which would just be to double bounty as many enemies as possible. The second challenge would be beating the face of God with the least amount of cat deaths, and no ubers or legendaries. Suicide units weren't counted as deaths, so Rock and Doron were particularly strong here. The third and final challenge was to beat Speechless Tongues with the lowest amount of base HP remaining, all while having a cat limit of 15. All three challenges had a tiebreaker condition of fastest clear. The winner of this round would be whichever team won the majority of the challenges here, and there would only be one draft for all three challenges. Now, this was a lot to take in, as teams would have to essentially do triple the work for a single round, but we were ready to do whatever it took to win. Our opponents this time, Gilgamesh X Queen V, consisted of Sir Killalot, Mason CT, and Goo Mister. Wait, how is Goo Mister in the semifinals? Well, at least he's good at writing fanfics, which is also where their team name comes from. For the record, I actually tried and agreed with Sir Kill to do a completely randomized draft for fun, but Re had enough of my tomfoolery throughout the tournament and prevented that. Probably for the better. Anyways, we tried a few strategies on all of the challenges, and our initial approach turned out to be the following. For the face of God, we would try to first pick Rock, as he was way better than any other unit for that stage, and we were pretty much guaranteed a win on that challenge. For Speechless Tongues, we would try to use Lumina to try to destroy the base the same time ours died to a Zangru. If 
you remember earlier in the video. Dying and winning on the same frame counts as a win with one base HP, so this would be the ideal strat to win with the respective challenge. And for Don't Rush Love, we would simply pick the better money combo units and secure Goemon, which was the only unit in the game with Zombie Killer and Double Bounty. With our strategy set in stone, we went into the drafts not knowing what would come out of it. We were Team A yet again, which was pretty funny considering we were Team A for the full tournament. We start off by banning LKD, who is a strong option in the face of God. Knowing that we have first pick, our goal is to take Brock and make it impossible for the opposition to win that challenge. Sir Kill responds by banning Soap and Balrog. Soap and Balrog both specifically target speechless tongues, but we weren't too worried about that one. Our next ban is Metal Cat, another good option on the face of God, and then we secure Rock as our first pick. Sir Kill responds by picking Kunio and Lumina. This is pretty problematic for us, as now Sir Kill has an advantage in both Speechless Tongues and Don't Rush Love. To try to compensate for this, we pick Richest Cat and Ban Manic Flying. Both of these units are used for their combos, and we saw this as something worth focusing on. Sir Kill follows up by banning Cat Machine and picking Blanca. Now we're positive that they're going to win Speechless Tongues for sure. Our last pick is Goemon, which gives us an advantage on Don't Rush Love. Overall, our draft could have been better if we had banned Blanca early, as he is essential to the fastest Speechless Tongue Slayer. The outcome on this draft was that both teams had one challenge each with nearly guaranteed victory, and then Don't Rush Love was pretty split and could go either way. So after the draft, I got to work and started making strategies for all of the stages. I started by finding out an optimal strat on the face of God, which only had 4 unit deaths. But this run was just a task experimental run, so it served more as something just to try to aim towards rather than something to replicate exactly. I then moved on to Speechless Tongues, where I set up a Volta hit to kill the base on the same frame we died to Zhang Ru, done by hitting a frame perfect breaker blast on that Zhang Ru. This was pretty fast, but I knew we wouldn't be as fast as the other team. Though, it was still worth putting in some effort for this challenge in case they didn't go all the way. After I got my run, I went back to the face of God and grinded it for a while. 9 unit deaths, then 8 unit deaths, and finally I got a run of 7 unit deaths, before deciding it was best to move on and make a Don't Rush Love run. Now, this stage in particular was a major pain, and felt extremely inconsistent to do runs on. Pair that with the pressure that it's the challenge that mattered most, and you get quite a frustrating situation on your hands. I grinded several strategies multiple times, but could never pull them off to the degree that I wanted to. In the meantime, the deadline for this challenge wasn't explicitly stated, but it was eventually given an extension and said to end on the Saturday of October 7th. My teammates were busy with a lot of work at the time, so it was up to me to finish all of these challenges. But finally, before the deadline was up, I got in one final run on Don't Rush Love, which I was satisfied with. Here's all three runs I submitted for this round.
I had no clue if we were winning or losing this round. So we waited in anticipation for results to come out. After the final submission deadline, Ree said that it came down to just a single challenge for both teams, which was Don't Rush Love. We already expected this for our match, but it was interesting that the other match went the same way. It turns out that Bagel's team won Speechless Tongues, but some confusion happened and they didn't submit a run for the face of God, giving that win to F2P. For DRL, the hosts were too lazy to count cash, so I decided to do it for all the teams. Bagel's team got around 75,000 cash spent, while F2P got 80,000. This means that F2P would be moving on to the finals. Next up, I counted Sir Kill's cash spent, and I made sure I counted correctly. This number would determine whether my team won or lost. Compared to the other match, our score was 99,000 cash spent, which is much higher than Bagel's team or F2P. But we knew that Sir Kill had tried harder than the other two teams on this challenge. So what did they get as their total? 83,000. We won this round. We're going to the finals now. This was an incredibly important victory for our team. We really just entered the tournament for free Nitro, and because first and second place teams would get it, our win was in the bag. Shout out to all the members of Team 14, Sir Kill, Mason CT, and Goo Mister, for being great competitors and just really cool people to talk to. Of course, we weren't nearly done yet, and after coming so far, there was only one place left to reach, the top. Later that day, the final challenge would be released. The two losing teams would also play this challenge to compete for third place. The challenge was, beating Revival of Origin without ever upgrading the wallet or going above 5,000 cash in the wallet, all while bringing the least amount of single target units. If both teams were to bring zero single target units, the tiebreaker would be the fastest clear. Additionally, a poll was hosted to see if the players wanted a draft this round or not. The results showed that there wouldn't be a draft this round, making it completely fair for both sides. There was no fluff, just one common challenge and only one team that could win. Our opponents were Team 18 or F2P Force to play, which had Deong, Coco, and Az. These were very strong players at the game, except my man Az, who was so bad he needed me to beat glass slippers for him during lunch. So as per usual, we started cooking. We quickly found out that non-Uber anti-relics were the fastest and best options for killing Luza quickly, so we ended up using them. Dogumaru, Nala, Edie, and True Super Feline were all part of the initial rush to kill Luza. After a bit more strategizing, I came up with a very good idea that would kill Luza even faster. So normally, you would have Luza hit Edie after Nala weakens him, because he would only do 40k damage then and Edie would survive allowing her to rebound for extra hits. This is only normally possible when Luzo doesn't have his strengthen, as when he does have it, he will do 80k damage while weakened, which is too much for Edie to take. However, we created a precise timing where we would have Luzo launch an attack while strengthened, right as the Sir Rail Wave came, which would knock back Edie and cause Luzo to miss her. This was a precise setup, but it was much faster as it allowed Edie to survive the whole battle and help take down the base. We later also figured out that Lil Valkyrie was optimal for cleaning up the base fast, and we made our final submission in the tournament. Here it is.
And well, with everything done, we waited until that final day. On Saturday, October 14th, the results came out, showing the best scores for every round in the tournament. Round 1, lowest base HP was 1 by Team 19, carried by a bagel. Round 2, the least amount of units deployed was 3 by Team 18, F2P forced to play. Round 3, fastest clear was 788 frames, by Team 12, the hardest leak. Knockout challenge, fastest clear was 1086 frames by Team 16, the coal miners. And finally, round 5, with no single target units, the fastest time was 3,353 frames by Team 12, the hardest leak. We won. Our team was victorious over RBC's official 22222 tournament, and that was simply great. Through our trials and tribulations, a complete roller coaster of emotions, and a lot of cat battling, we had finally come on top. Coming in second place was F2P forced to play. 3rd place was Carried by a Bagel, and 4th place was Gilgamesh x Queen V. Prizes were given out to everyone, and in order to commemorate the entire event, they added the symbol of our team as an emoji to the server, the Hardest Leak. This event was an absolute blast, and had been some of the most fun I've had in this Battlecats community. Although it wasn't run too smoothly at times, I think it was still a great starting point for the idea of Battlecats tournaments. Everyone had a good time, and that's what mattered the most. I'd also like to give another shout out to Ree, Game Changer, and Salted Sweets for being great hosts of this event. I will say though, I'd be happy to help host any future Battlecats tournaments if the opportunity arises. And well, that's pretty much it. Being the winner of the only Battlecats tournament I've known is a nice title to have though. Have a nice day, and I'm gonna go on my way to play some BCU stages now. Goodbye.